Sage Wanderer here, and welcome to my autobiography, The Perils of an Interesting Life. This is Chapter 9, Dangerous Dan Destroys the Cemetery. Don't, don't, don't. So, any coming-of-age story, uh, you know, any great teenage romp or comedy, uh, any of those stories is reliant upon a cast of characters. And so, uh, this is kind of an introduction to the cast of characters of my teenage life. And as you know, I made a decision to go out in the world and experience life. And to me, that meant getting right down <laughs> with the common folk and, and coming out of my uh, ivory church tower that I was raised in. And uh, it was quite an experience. I had a lot of experiences. And I was lucky to have quite a cast of characters in the uh, last episode we talked about Kevin the army brat and in this episode I'd like to feature some new characters uh, the first one I'd like to talk about is um, is is a man named renegade and no that's not his real name now what you got to know is that we all had street names everybody had a different street name nobody was really using their own names Kevin did Kevin was just Kevin and there were a few kids that were like that uh, one of my favorite uh, fake names based on a real name was a Hispanic kid named uh, Anthony Martinez. Uh, and he uh, changed his name a little bit and called himself Tony Martini and said that he was Italian. So he passed himself off as Italian and uh, it wasn't until he got busted uh, for a major heist uh, that I may tell that story in a future episode. Uh, and was sent away for you know many many years uh, to first reform school and then big boy prison for what he did as a teenager. Um, but anyway, um, yeah. So everybody had some variation of their real name, and uh, but Renegade was just Renegade, and he was a large man. Renegade was about six foot four, uh, solid like chiseled out of stone, broad shouldered, uh, probably about a hundred and ninety to two hundred pounds. And, uh, you know, muscular, fit guy. I apologize for the broken camera. I'm getting a new phone. But anyway, um, yeah, Renegade uh, was a biker. And uh, he had, uh, you know, had a goatee. He had uh, blondish hair, dirty blonde hair. And, um, you know, he, uh, he wore um, the Levi jacket with the sleeves cut off like a biker would. But he didn't have a motorcycle. He was on foot all the time. And I never saw a renegade drive a car. And we all gathered at a place called Games Emporium on Riverside Drive. It was a video arcade and pool hall. There was all ages. And they even had a dance floor in the back. And in the parking lot across the street was this public parking lot where we all gathered, much to the chagrin of the local law enforcement. And so this was a group of people called the, uh, we referred to ourselves as the freaks. And so there, there were the freaks and the soches, or the, uh, 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 the preppies. Uh, those were the country club kids, the rich kids. And there was the jocks, those were the athletes. And there was the goat ropers, those were the cowboys. And so I was a cowboy because I lived on a ranch and I was a goat roper. And I came into this group as a goat roper. And I kind of crossed over from being a goat roper to being a freak mainly because of Renegade. So I was down there because I liked video games, dressed in my cowboy outfit. When a man started giving me a hard time, um, a guy ironically named Tex, who was a long-haired, bearded uh, uh, Texan who had, uh, uh, had moved to Medford, and he was crippled up from a, a, a big... A truck, a diesel truck accident. He was a truck driver. Now, he's also been a biker, too. But um, Tex was giving me a hard time and, you know, calling me a goat roper and making fun of my hat. And, uh, you know, you're going to fight a crippled guy who's got double crutches, so you're just going to stand there and let him give you a hard time. Until finally I was like, look, just because you're crippled doesn't mean I have to put up with this, so, you know, shut the F up. And when I did that, the local bully... A man we called Mike Arms because he was a bodybuilder with giant big biceps. We just called him Arms. But uh, Mike Arms decided he was going to jump in there with Tex and maybe whoop my butt or just have some fun with me because, you know, he was a much larger person than me. And um, so um, Mike Arms and I looked like I, it looked like I was about to do what I always do and 
and fight the toughest guy in the crowd. I found the bully. He identified me. We've talked about how I clash with bullies, and it looked like I was about to fight this guy, and I thought for the first time in many years I was going to really, really get my butt whipped by this guy because he was a known brawler. I was still kind of a kid and I hadn't been in a fight in a while, and he was so much bigger and stronger and more fit than I. But I stood up to him. I was like, you know, I'm not backing down. You know, I'm not, you know, this isn't, you don't own this parking lot. Uh, goat ropers can go where goat ropers want to. This is America. I can go wherever I want. You guys aren't going to boss me around. You're not going to tell me what to do. And um, this was, I believe, either right after I met Kevin or right before. But um, Renegade, this biker guy, this big biker guy, the only guy in our group who could take Mike Arms and Mike knew it. Because Renegade got his name because he was... Uh, by his own admission, on the run from a manslaughter charge in California where uh, he had accidentally killed a man in a fist fight. And it hit him too hard, knocked him into a uh, door jam, split his head open. And that uh, the cops were looking for him and he didn't want to stick around. And so he split and he was going by the name Renegade and it was before computers and, and video cameras watching everything. And a guy could do that back then, just change who you are. I don't know that any of us believed his story, but it made him even cooler than he already was because he was older for one thing. Renegade was like 24, 25, and the rest of us were between 15 and 20 <laughs> for the most part. And um, yeah, 15 to 18 year old range. And so anyway, um, Renegade intervened and he was just like, Mike, leave him alone. And Mike bowed up at him a little bit, but Renegade just stood up and took a step toward him. And said, I said, leave him the F alone. <laughs> it went a big barking voice. And i never seen this ever happen with Mike Arms. Uh, he just kind of scampered away. <laughs> Nobody wanted to mess with Renegade. And so I realized right then I kind of found myself a bodyguard. And Renegade, you know, told me his story. He was a very interesting guy. And he was the first person to ever smoke marijuana with me. And... Uh, I think it was, and it was the first time I ever, uh, Kevin was with me the first time I ever smoked marijuana. And that was with, uh, that was with Renegade. But, <clears throat> it was a great cast of characters. There were lots of different people that you will meet as I finish telling this story out. It's probably going to take two or three videos to get me to Texas. But, um, at any rate, um, yeah, it, it, we were out one night drinking and smoking with this guy that kind of we kind of knew and he, he kind of drifted into our life and out and I don't even rem remember his name but let me tell you I remember his car because <laughs> this dude had the coolest freaking car he had a 19 I think it was a 1969 or 68 Barracuda and uh Barracuda but anyhow <laughs> what a great car what a great car it wasn't crazy it was like a metallic green like metallic lime green not my favorite color but had the tuck and roll seats leather seats and it was just and I mean, what a beast what a beast and i got to ride around in it and um but the i don't remember much about the guy other than this one particular night he was too drunk to drive his own car and there was a guy in our group that wanted to drive his car so bad he wanted to drive everyone's car i let him drive my car his name was Dangerous Dan. And there's a reason why we called him Dangerous Dan, because the guy was a little off and he was totally dangerous. And he was also another one of those older guys. I tended to hang around with the older guys that could buy the beer, because that just made life easier, you know? <laughs> I didn't have to go finding someone to buy his beer. I got four or five different people that could do it. Uh, there's Renegade, there's Dangerous Dan, and... Um, Renegade had a fake ID, though, even though he was old enough. But he, I don't think he, he ever got, he never got uh, carded, because he, he looked he looked 30, <laughs> even though he claimed to be like, 24 or something like that. Uh, but anyway, back to Dangerous Dan. Uh, dangerous Dan was uh, dangerous for a very big reason, that he had a major story. See, Dangerous Dan was kind of a little bit of a ward of the state, or kind of like his mom watched out for him. Like he lived with his mother, and he had a lot of rules, because he had gotten in some serious trouble when he was uh, 17 or 18, and only by being put on probation and being carefully watched was he and medicated was he allowed to stay amongst us, because Dangerous Dan blew a car up um, with a Bic lighter, and he 
told me how to do it. And I won't, I won't do it. I won't tell you how to do it. This is pretty much common knowledge. But, you know, it doesn't work unless it's on a car with a carburetor. So you can't really do this anymore. But once upon a time, you could open a big lighter up all the way and use it as an igniter to blow the hood off and set a car on fire if you knew what you were doing. You'd unhook a spark plug. I won't give you the... Anyhow. <laughs> But Dangerous Dan knew how to do this, and he had a rival and a guy that insulted him, and the guy really loved his car, so he blew this guy's car up. And Dangerous Dan was a gearhead. Like, he had all the hot rod magazines. He had every kind of car magazine you could think of. He was way into cars. And part of the problem was he couldn't have a driver's license uh, because they took it away from him because of what he did. I don't know. that, that There was a lot to the story. I couldn't get it all out of him. And I, I kind of wish in the Internet days, maybe, maybe I will now that we have the Internet, days I might go back and try to find out the whole story as to how dangerous Dan got labeled as being so dangerous but few people would let dangerous Dan drive their cars I did because he would just bully me and pressure me and I liked him so I felt sorry for him it wasn't like he was mean to me it was more like he was like dude come on come on man come on come on peer pressure and so I was like oh, I, I, you know so I let him drive my car he was actually an excellent driver I learned a lot of what I know about taking small cars off-road <laughs> from him because he used to take my car off-road with me screaming, Stop! Give me the keys back! He was dangerous. <clears throat> but we were all out running around in uh, this, this one guy's uh, Barracuda. And we had a couple of girls with us. Kind of bad for both of the other guys because they were underage. So there was six of us. There was three guys and three girls stuffed in this car. And uh, the guy that owned the car got too drunk to drive, and so he let Dangerous Dan have the keys. <laughs> and so Dangerous Dan was being non-dangerous and just in love with this car, going on and on about every detail about it, from the suspension to how it was different from the year before, and that just, he knew everything about the car. And we decided to go park in a cemetery and, uh, you know, Smoke a little weed and drink a little booze and just chill out in this cemetery. And kids, I don't know why. I don't, it was one of the girls' ideas. I do remember that. One of the girls that was with us. And um, so, Danger stands behind the wheel. The other drivers passed out. No, there's seven of us in the car because there's four, four guys and three girls. And um, we're just crammed in this big old boat of a car. And we're, we're just hanging out there, and Dangerous stands behind the wheel. We're all smoking. We don't even think anything of it. When we see a spotlight right over the crest of the hill in the cemetery pointed right at our car. And it don't take a brain, uh, brain surgeon to realize that that's a police spotlight. That's a police car. It just came over the hill we came in at. It's between us and the only exit out of the cemetery. And there is two other gates, but they're both uh, padlocked shut. And uh, there's just no getting over them. Now, the thing is, is that even though there's this gate that, that blocks you from driving into the cemetery, one whole side of the cemetery, the downhill side, is open. You can walk in there from the park across the street. And um, so, Dangerous Dan is, is in a panic. The cop's right there. He's smoking weed, he's on probation, he's drinking beer, he's behind the wheel, he doesn't have a license, he's overage, there's three underage girls in the car, plus us t other two underage boys. The only other guy he can pin on it is asleep, I was over there passed out, and he's in a dead panic. He's like, I'm going to jail, I'm going to jail, I'm going, and he's like, I am not effing going to jail, I'm not effing going to jail. And... Kevin's in the back street seat yelling, punch it, punch it, just get us out of here, punch it, just go, just go. And, you know, you can't really see anything, and Dan, because it's dark, but there's a little moonlight, so you can kind of see, and it's enough to where Dan decides that headlights are a bad idea. So he just takes off through the open country of the cemetery, first down this one road towards the gate. We don't know the back gate's locked. We're going, go to the back gate, go to the back gate. We honestly, at that point, don't know that it's locked. And we go to the back gate, it's locked. Cops are coming, lights going now, sirens on. Cops, but he's moving cautiously on the road, and we're still on the road at this point. But when we get to the gate and he's right there, we uh, he turns and runs along the fence, looking for that area over by the park that's opened up so he can drive out onto the road and get out of there. And uh, we're running down the fence. I don't know, things got out of control. He's dodging, um, you know, the big 
uh, monuments and uh, all of the headstones. And when I and finally we just we we hit this hill and we just kind of catch air and I hear bam right on the bottom side of this car wakes the guy up who's passed out. He's like what what? He's in a total panic in the front seat. And the girls are screaming and freaking out. Kevin is laughing because Kevin is crazy. Kevin is laughing, screaming, punch it, just go, just go, just go. And I'm sitting back there going, we're all going to jail. We're all going to jail. We're all going to jail. I'm going to jail. We're all going to jail. Oh my gosh, I'm going to jail. <laughs> and meanwhile, we're rocketing, rocketing through this hilly cemetery. And he takes out at least four or five more of these uh, headstones. And I mean, he's smacking them with, I guess the bumper hits them and they're knocks them over. So the car is just driving over the top of them. It's just, it's flattening them. Uh, you know, like, like walking on wheat, it just pushes them right over. And um, the, the funny thing about that car is it mangled up the bumper, but they really made them to last back then. It didn't really do anything else to the car. I was for certain we were gonna be disabled. You know, that I just didn't see there was any way of hitting a, a headstone and knocking it over, even with a big, you know, V8 car like that, and it not take the car out, but it would have took my Pinto out. <laughs> but he hit four or five of those headstones, and when they left the road and started smacking those headstones, the cop just started backing up and turning around and trying to, like, follow him on the road. He would not desecrate the graves, whereas Dangerous Dan had no problem desecrating the... He wasn't going to jail that night. And um, I'm yelling at him, just stop. Just give yourselves up. We're, we're, it's okay. We're going to jail. It's all right. We can get out. And, there, and you know, meanwhile, he's just in a... <laughs> through them. But we make it through the other side, jumps the curb, swish tails out of there, and we zip out of town to a place called... Uh, well, no, it's not the Expo Ponds. We're on the other side of town. It's where Harry and David is, is now. I don't. I think they must have filled the ponds in, but there was the gravel pits, gravel pit ponds on the other end of town. And uh, we went out there and, and decompressed for a minute and, and assessed the damage. And uh, that was the last time anybody let Dangerous Dan drive their car, <laughs> including myself. But luckily, none of us went to jail. But it was headline news the next day, and I, I would like to go back and find it. Well, not headline news. It was in the paper. And I think they mentioned it on one of the newscasts as well, that vandals had destroyed several headstones uh, and uh, had damaged the headstones and gotten away. So we were considered the vandals who vandalized the cemetery. But really, it was just dangerous. Dan being dangerous and refusing to go back to jail. <laughs> All right, we'll talk to you next time on The Perils of an Interesting Life.